So now let's look at what the philosophers think of human nature, what they think of how good or bad human beings are, and we need to plan our societies around these natures. We are going to be looking at the most influential thinkers, Plato, Hobbes, Rousseau, I think Smith. Smith is one you don't often hear mentioned, but I think his psychology of human nature is just brilliant and needs to be appreciated more. Uh, the only other famous one that we won't really look at is Freud, but his is very similar to Hobbes, right? You can ask me questions about Freud's conception, but very similar to Hobbes, and when we chart it, pretty similar. All right, so we'll start with Plato. Now, I need to give a little uh, proviso for this one, because technically this isn't directly Plato's view. This is the view that he puts in the mouth of Glaucon. In Plato's dialogues, what he does is he takes real people with real positions living in Athens at the time, but then he makes a character in his book to represent that idea. When most people talk about this, they will just talk about it as Plato's view, but to be clear, Plato's real own view is not clearly stated anywhere, but people usually use this Glaucon to represent this position. All right, um, do we know who Plato is? Yes, clear, it's amazing. This guy that was writing 2,400 years ago is seems completely current in everything he's talking about. Brilliant stuff to read. All right, so let's start with his conception of the ring. Don't you dare say anything about him getting this from Tolkien and watching those movies. This is, what, 2,300 years before Tolkien, right? Why do you guys steal everything from the philosophers and then try to take credit? Stop it, right? Okay, so let's start in the Plato reading, but we're going to go in reverse order. Let's start, and I'm in the second to last paragraph, it's only one page, but I'm about two-thirds down the third paragraph on the one-page Plato reading. Paragraph begins according to, I'm about ten lines into it. So we have this basic story of a shepherd out there wandering on the prairie, and he finds this ring, and he finds, sorry, a monster in a big giant in a crevice, and he takes the ring, and he puts it on, and let's join the story there. When the shepherd perceived this, he made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result. When he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible. When outwards, he was visible. Right? So he's turning the ring, and he sees that he becomes visible when he turns it this way, and then invisible when he turns it the other way. Good? Whereupon he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court, where as soon as he arrived he seduced the queen and with her help conspired against the king and slew him and took the kingdom. <laughs> now notice this, right? This is a passage of literature where it's, there is no time between. You get the idea that he tests this ring a couple of times and he already had the plan in mind. A quick aside, what this reminds me of is if you're reading uh, the Bible, you're reading Genesis, what is it, 19 or 22 of Genesis, I can't remember, and you hear about Abraham being told to kill his son and burn him as an offering to God, and the literary device is the same. When Abraham heard God told him to slay his son, he got the wood and he prepared and he left early the next morning. Like, whoa, right? Like, no negotiating. So in this case, like, he already had this planned? I'm not sure. Now read farther. Suppose now that there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one of them and the unjust the other. So a good person has one and a bad person have one, has one. No man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. Now, let's pause and let's do this test, right? This is a fun thing to do in class. Let's pretend that you have this magic ring. It can make you invisible whenever you want, so you can do whatever you want. No one will find you in what you're doing. And I ask this question. How many of you would use the ring to do something illegal? So in your little office, in your little room, right? Raise your hand if you would do something illegal. Yep, <laughs> I would too. Now notice, I am going to ask a second question, and I hope right, you think deeply about this. I said, would you do something illegal? Of course, right, a lot of us would. Now I want to ask a separate question, and please, I hope you know that these are very distinct questions. 
Would you do something you know to be immoral if you had this ring? No, I wouldn't, right? The key difference. What would you do? Now, a lot of you have are trying to say, I wouldn't do anything immoral and I wouldn't do anything illegal. I wouldn't do anything immoral, but I would definitely do things that are illegal. What would I do? And some of you are saying, oh, I wouldn't break any laws even if I was invisible. Wait till you hear my idea. I would infiltrate news outlets and news websites. All of those that lie, I would infiltrate and I would use really low-tech technology. I would use crayons and construction paper and whenever they lie, right, I would hack into their system and use a little simple construction paper thing and all you would see is you're watching the what YouTube video or a website and you would just see a piece of paper go up in front of their face saying they're lying about healthcare in Canada or they're lying about COVID or they're lying about this. Oh my gosh, I would love to do this with Trump 24 seven. Is this against the law? Yeah, privacy rights, right? This is against the law, but that would be absolutely laws I would break. I'm so sick of misinformation in this country. Anyway, don't you think? Don't you think you might do that too? Now we make a distinction. But so what does this mean? Well, Plato's got this genius idea that Lord of the Rings stole, is this idea that if you catch people when they have no consequences, that reveals what they really want to do. All right, so read a little farther. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own when he could safely take what he liked out of the market or go into houses and lie with anyone at his pleasure or kill or release from prison whom he would and in all respects be like a god among men. Then the actions of the just would be as the actions of the unjust. They would both tend to the same goal. And this we may truly affirm to be a great proof that a man is just, not willingly or because he thinks justice is any good to him individually, but of necessity. For wherever anyone thinks he can safely be unjust, there he is unjust. So pause there for a second. Let's get out our chart again and see where we think this position would go. Again, we'll call it Plato, it's Plato's Glaucon, but where would we think this would put him? Well, I think we can see. If we're looking at not only just how people act, but their character and intentions, then this is a pretty easy, I mean, it's almost the definition of selfishness. Does this person cause harm? Yes, right? He kills someone, right, to take over the kingdom. Obviously, selfishness, could it be sadistic? No, it doesn't seem sadistic. You agree, right? He's not doing this for the pleasure of it. He is doing this strictly to benefit himself. And he seems to be almost rational or at least consistent in doing so. But it's clearly selfish. He's hurting people to benefit himself. Now, because we're our philosophers, we also want to be critical of these ideas. So we want to ask this question. Is giving someone a ring, does that truly reveal their innate nature? That is what Plato is trying to do here. This is in a book called The Republic where he's doing social political philosophy and he's telling us what society should look like and he starts with a discussion of human nature, like we are doing. Does this reveal our innate self? I don't think it does. It is a good argument, this is a good way to look at it, but you're simply taking someone that is already fully socialized and you're just giving them the inability to be punished. You are giving them a consequence-free social motive. Do you get it? I think if you took someone that wasn't so socialized and they had this ring, I don't think they would do these same things. I don't think a person that is more neutral in their socialization wants power like this. No, right? I think someone in a, in a more neutral setting would use this ring to do other sorts of things. Maybe be a vigilante for justice or, or I don't know, something that's just more personally gratifying. Good? Now you can imagine those things being pretty creepy, right? But I don't think we'd see the same results. This isn't necessarily the innate self. Anyway, I still think the view is clear. This is a good representation of how this view says people are selfish in their innate desires. Now turn to what Plato is saying about our social nature. So again, reverse order, I'm going to the third line at the top of the page. Let me read. And so when men have both done and suffered injustice, and have had experience of both, 
Any who are not able to avoid the one and obtain the other think that they had better agree among themselves to have neither. Hence they began to establish laws and mutual covenants, and that which was ordained by law was termed by them lawful and just. This, it is claimed, is the origin and nature of justice. It is a mean or compromise between the best of all, which is to do injustice and not be punished, and the worst of all, which is to suffer injustice without the power of retaliation. And justice being at a middle point between the two is tolerated not as a good, but as the lesser evil and honored where men are too feeble to do injustice. Now get the idea. He is painting a picture of imagining different situations. Imagine a situation where you are all powerful and everyone around you is weak and you would say, well, I wouldn't agree to being just in those cases. I can do whatever I want and no one can cause revenge on me. Now, you imagine the other scenario where you are one of the weak people and you would say, I never get anything I want. Everybody just takes from me, steals from me. Fine. Well, he's saying a more re realistic scenario is people being in some sort of middle ground. They don't think they can always steal without being stolen from, always being beat up without someone else beating you up, and especially in the, in the world of guns, right? There is always some weakling with a gun who has a bigger ego than you. So what does he say? Well, this is one of the original ideas of what's called a social contract. The idea is that people in a society virtually sign a contract saying, it is better to have justice than to be able to get everything you want. So we will agree to live at peace. I won't steal from you. You won't steal from me. If you steal, the society punishes you. This is a better way to live than to live always being worried about being stolen from or about being harmed. We will agree that it's better to live in peace than to be able to get everything you want. Fine. So what does this amount to though when it comes to our social nature? So we've got to fill in the lines. So what is the idea? Well, we do have to think about the innate nature when we're thinking about the social nature. Because clearly Plato's saying people are innately selfish. They would hurt others to get what they want. Well, what are the effects now of having consequences and laws? We've agreed to a social contract, so now people don't do the wrong thing because now they fear the consequences. They don't have a ring of invisibility. So what do you think this amounts to? Now notice, if you were simply looking at actions, you might start to climb your way up this chart. You might start to say, hey, maybe they're sympathetic or compassionate. But notice, we are not looking at a very simplistic moral psychology. We are trying to deal with the whole human being. What are their intentions? Well, clearly their intentions are self-benefit. Even agreeing to the social contract is for your own benefit. So they are not doing this because they're now suddenly compassionate because the laws say we should have a contract, we should have peace, and there are laws. Well, notice, when we painted the picture of the shepherd, what did the shepherd do as soon as he was consequence free? He acted on these impulses that he was stifling because of consequences. Do you get it? So I think we end up with, I think, a clear apathetic sort of nature. People want to do bad, but they can't get away with it. So what do they do? They don't do bad, but there is nowhere in here where it says, we're finally free to do the good things we want to do. No, it is a very cynical view. People want to do bad, they just can't, and so justice is a compromise. We want to do bad, but we're too afraid to do so. Apathy, I think, is pretty good. There could be an argument for a mixed nature, but where is the intent to do good? There is no talk about here about how it would be rewarding to help each other. That's not the conversation Glaucon is having. Agreed? I think it's pretty clear. So we have a view that says society makes us a little better, turns us from selfishness to people who are too afraid to do bad. Next, let's turn to Hobbes. Let me give a little introduction of who Hobbes is. So who do you think of when I say the name Hobbes? You might be too young, but ask your parents, and when they hear Hobbes, they will think of Calvin and Hobbes. If you've seen the comics, some of them are brilliant. Maybe take a second here and look them up, right? The story of a little jerk little kid with his stuffed animal tiger who would come to life just to get the boy in trouble. <laughs> What's the idea? Yes. When you think of Thomas Hobbes the philosopher, you very much should think of Calvin and Hobbes the cartoon. 
Waterston, the author of the cartoon, did have Thomas Hobbes in mind. This is an illustration of this idea. You know where else you're going to see an illustration of this? Lord of the Flies. If any of you read that or watched the movie of it, that, Golding, is there illustrating Thomas Hobbes' state of nature. L let's do a little tangent here. Yes, Waterston is using this little brat kid Hobbes to represent Tom and Ho Thomas Hobbes. For you nerds, do you know who Calvin the Tiger is named after? If you're a nerd, you know it's John Calvin, the, the, the Swiss theologian. And what was Calvin's view? Terrible. It was like Hobbes. Calvin said, the life of man is one of total depravity. Human beings are completely depraved. They cannot save themselves. <laughs> exactly. Now, for fun, do you know that um, media, cartoons, Disney, constantly puts in these major philosophers so we can see these little analogs? So you know a lot of philosophers in a very indirect way, and you don't know you do. Uh, we could take something like Rousseau and Locke in the Lost series. Ask your parents about that. Or here's one. Do you guys know that you have a really good insight into the view of ancient skeptical philosophers? You know one really well. There is an ancient skeptic named Timon. What was Timon's view? No, don't start singing the song, right? No worries. There was an ancient Stoic philosopher named Timon who was immortalized in the Lion King. Yes, that was his view. Don't worry about anything to maintain tranquility, have no beliefs. It was a very solid skeptical philosophy. And you know it because you know which one was he, the warthog or the lemur or meerkat? I can't remember. I'm not a Lion King scholar, but that's ancient skepticism. You know that philosopher now. Anyway, back to Hobbes. So now who was Hobbes to be more nerdy about this? Hobbes, right, was a British philosopher who had a huge impact on government. Our founding fathers all were reading Hobbes and Locke. They were looking at the Magna Carta. I am so thankful that we had such a great group of nerds founding our constitution and our country. I am so glad this wasn't restarted in a day like today. Brilliant. They were all reading Hobbes. Luckily, they were also reading Locke. And some of them were starting to read, also find thing, people like Adam Smith. But for the most part, Hobbes, Locke, major influence on our constitution. So now let's look what Hobbes sa at what Hobbes says. Hobbes, like Plato says, we need, look, need to look at the innate nature to see what people are like so we can see how to group them into a society with laws. He calls it the state of nature. This becomes the archetype for the next couple hundred years. Here's what he says, and this is very quotable, right? Some of these lines will sound familiar. So, very beginning of the Hobbes reading. Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe. Now, already, the, re the writing is getting very formalized, right? Scholars at this time talk with a very haughty sort of language. I wish they just kept writing the way Plato did. For ordinary people, anyway, little high flute in language, we'll get used to it. So what is he saying? He is saying, let's look at a time before men lived under a common power that kept them in awe. Look at that word. It's actually a religious word. Awe is what the Israelites felt when they were wandering the wilderness being led by God. What does it mean? They were terrified of God. Pillars of fire would come down. But they also respected God. So awe is feel for fearful respect, like you feel about your dad when you're, say, seven years old, right? You respect him, but he's also pretty scary. That's the idea. So what is this common power that today keeps people in awe? The government. Popo, judges, courts, prisons, the military, we are in awe, respect and fear. So Hobbes is saying, let's go back to a time before governments, before we were afraid of its power. They are in that condition which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. So notice, 
This is not a war where you put on uniforms and fight against an enemy. It is all-out war. Everyone is against everyone else. You can't trust anybody. <laughs> this is scary. Let's skip a little paragraph. Sorry, let's skip three lines and go into the next paragraph. These are the most famous lines from Plato's work. I mean, sorry. These are the most famous lines from Hobbes' work. In such a condition, there is no place for industry. You can't get a job. You can't work. Because their, their fruit thereof is uncertain. And consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation, no use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. <laughs> Damn, you get this. You can't do anything. You can't study. You can't work together. Right? Keep going. And which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Let's spell this out. You cannot do art projects. You can't build anything. You can't work on history. You can't read books. Why? Because, let's say you actually got something accomplished. You wrote a good book or did a piece of art or built a little shed in your backyard. What would happen? You would be killed if it's any good because people would take it. But it's even worse than that. The real reason you can't work on a shed in your backyard or read books is because you have to spend all your moments defending your life from people who are trying to take from you. You are constantly in fear and in defense, right, because you are always being threatened by people who want to harm you. Do you get the kind of chaos this is? So, pause there. Where would we put Hobbes' idea of the state of nature? Again, Golding's Lord of the Flies is trying to paint a picture of this. Take a bunch of jerky little prepubescents and put them on an island. They will start killing themselves, each other over shells and fruit. Get it? Where do we see? Here is a little tricky because I know that if you're thinking clearly about this, you almost want to put Hobbes, innate person, on a line between selfish and sadistic. We do want to say that Plato's idea was straight selfish. Hobbes is even a little worse. Now, does this qualify as sadism? I don't think it does. Sadism means you hurt people for its own sake, for the sheer joy out of it. You don't really see that. You do see stupid, irrational chaos, but it is still seeking their own benefit. It is not just the joys of hurting people. So it is selfishness, but I'm going to move it down closer to the line because this is almost irrational selfishness. But it's not sadism. Now read on. We are going to have to read between the lines even more to get a social self. The social nature is not clearly stated here. And you could read more and more of Hobbes. He tells us a lot more about how do we keep these people, these selfish, irrational people in check than he does about the psychology of the social self. But if you're reading between the lines, what do you find? We need, now notice the, the, type, the name of this book. It's called Leviathan. What is that? That is the terrifying sea creature of the Old Testament. What are you seeing? We need government to be so terrifying that people will obey these laws out of sheer awe of the forces against them in the government. So what's the idea? Take a selfish nature, an almost irrational selfish nature, like Freud would say. And what do you need to do? This is where Freud differs a little bit. Freud would say you need to repress them in their uh, super ego so that they repress all their strong desires so that they can live comfortably in this society. What is Hobbes saying? Hobbes is saying we need people to be absolutely terrified of the government. Well, how do you act when you're terrified? I think we go back to the metaphor I just gave you of the seven-year-old son or daughter in fear of their father. If you point a, paint a picture of an irrational seven-year-old only try to get what's best for them, then you need a father that they're terrified of, otherwise they steal all the cookies from their brothers and sisters. The idea here is we have a society where people are frozen in their fear of the government. How do you act when powerful people are watching you? You act like little robots. You are afraid to do anything. 
I think this leads to what? Apathy. Although, again, I think it should go down a little bit from where Plato says, because the intentions are so much worse here, and it's pure fear. It's not a social contract built on seeing that it's best to live in peace. This is just straight fear of the powerful government. So I think, right, it's closer towards selfishness, but actions look apathetic. We are too afraid to do wrong. Now, again, I think we should always be critical of these works. What is really neat here, and I love when authors and especially philosophers do this, is Hobbes is hearing us saying, dude, you're exaggerating. We're not terrified. We're not always looking to kill each other. And it's only the government that keeps us at peace. Well, notice he takes this on. So let's try to be critical and see. We see Hobbes' views. But I want to see if he is exaggerating because he knows he'll be accused of that. So let's look at the last paragraph, the third paragraph in the Hobbes little short reading. Here's what he says. It may seem strange to some man that has not well weighed these things, that nature should thus dissociate and render men apt to invade and destroy one another. And he may therefore, not trusting to this inference made from the passions, desire perhaps to have the same confirmed by experience. Very fancy language. He is simply saying, some of you are looking at this and saying, where's the evidence for this? Because you're clearly exaggerating. People aren't always looking to hurt each other to take from one another. You're going too far, Hobbes. But he has a brilliant defense. Look what he says next. Let him therefore consider within himself. When taking a journey, he arms himself and seeks to go well accompanied. When going to sleep, he locks his doors. When even in his house, he locks his chest. And this when he knows there be laws and public officers armed to revenge all injuries shall be done him. What opinion he has of his fellow subjects when he rides, rides armed, of his fellow citizens when he locks his doors, and of his children and servants when he locks his chest. Does he not there as much accuse mankind by his actions as I do by my words? Brilliant. Do a lot of you have guns? Do you always lock your doors? Are you afraid of people who are trying to steal from you? Yes. Hobbes seems to be making a very good point. But I think he's still exaggerating. Do you find other societies, Canadians or people that live in the middle Midwest, who don't, don't lock their doors at all. Why? Now think about it. When you lock up your car, are you afraid of me stealing it? <laughs> I could find you, right? Are you afraid of me stealing your car? No. You're not afraid of everyone stealing your stuff. You're not afraid of everyone killing you or robbing from you. You don't lock your door because of everyone. Now, there might be some of you that do, and I am so sorry. Stop watching so much TV and YouTube videos. You are way too cynical. But the typical person locks their door not because they're afraid of human beings. It's because they're afraid of some human beings in society. And if you think about it, it's a, it's a fairly small percentage. Who are you afraid of? You are afraid of the psycho and the desperate. And think of all the people you're thinking of. I think they fit in those two categories. Some people who are nuts and some people who are so desperate or in such a bad situation or so psychologically desperate that they would steal from you or even harm you. But what percentage is this? I think it's a very small percentage. So why in a rural community in the Midwest don't you lock your doors? Because you know who's around. You look around you and you say, I don't see any desperate or psychotic people, and so I don't need to lock my doors. If one moves in, I'm going to have to start locking my doors. The problem is, in a society like we live in right now, populated cities, the people who are psycho or desperate are, are hard to identify, and we don't know where they are at any moment, so we lock our doors just for that small percentage of the population. Do you get the idea? But let me go on a little fun tangent here. Because we actually often raise our kids as if Hobbes is completely right about this stuff. How many parents have their kids terrified of strangers? Stranger danger. I remember in my young days, I was working in a surf shop, and this mom would come in with her teenage son and her young daughter, and this is what she kept saying to her young daughter. The little girl, she was so sweet. I remember getting to know her a little bit. 
But if she would wander too far away from her mom, her mom would say this. Sweetie, I think I hear a stranger coming. <laughs> like, what the hell? Instead of just saying, stay with me, she had her terrified of strangers. Now, notice how a little kid is going to respond to this. Let's say that you're at an amusement park. You're in this big crowded area or a shopping mall. And your kid somehow wanders off. Well, what are they going to do now? They're going to be terrified. <laughs> and what are they going to do? They're going to look for someone wearing a uniform and someone probably with a gun to protect them because you're going to give them this idea that strangers are bad, but the government is good. Oh my gosh, they are ripe for pedophiles. And why would you go to someone with a gun? That's pretty scary when you see right, police shootings and killings lately. Anyway, sorry, don't be afraid of that. What do I tell my kids, right? I tell them, just look for some adults. Look for a group of adults and ask them to help you. A group of people are typically very good. Adults are typically very nice to kids. Now, don't go look for one adult next to a van, right? Don't do that. But just find a group of parents, right? They will help you. People are nice. There is a very few people that are bad. Just find a group of parents and they will help you. They will help you find me.